The scripture from which Alan will be sharing this morning is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. I'm going to be reading the first 26 verses. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now was sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and, not for your, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? join me for prayer. Oh God, you are present in every moment of our lives. And again this morning, we your children have gathered. We need to hear a fresh word from you. Speak, oh God. Answer the deepest needs of our hearts, we pray. Amen. Lucy, Peter, Susan, and Edmund are the four children we meet in C.S. Lewis's classic little book, The Chronicles of Narnia. They are the children who go through the closet and find themselves in that frozen land of Narnia. Lucy meets Mr. Tumnus, a fawn, who explains to her that Narnia is frozen because of the wicked white witch. And in the land of Narnia, it is always winter, but never Christmas. Friends, we celebrated Christmas back quite a while ago, a few months back. We have had a long, cold, hard winter. Finally, we are starting to see the grass getting green, the crocuses coming up. 
the daffodils, the snowdrops. We are grateful. We really are. We're also in the season of Lent. Lent is that period of 40 days, not counting the Sundays, between Ash Wednesday and Easter. It is that time in the season in the life of the Christian church when we have pondered the life of Jesus. We have looked at his teachings. We have looked at his suffering. What he did for us to bring us our salvation. Now, the somberness of Lent is tempered by spring. The days are getting longer. It's getting warmer. The somberness of Lent is also tempered by our awareness that Easter's only two weeks away. This week, as I was working on the message, I was thinking about those words of, I was reminded of those words of Mr. Tumnus the Fawn. So it's always winter, but never Christmas. I, I was reading Pope Francis's uh, letter entitled The Joy of the Gospel. And in that he writes that for some Christians, there are Christians for whom it is always Lent, but never Easter. Some of us have had a wonderful week. We had a great week, and that's good. Some of us are struggling. We're struggling for a whole variety of different reasons. And for some of us, it might be because of health issues. For some of us, it's because we've lost a loved one. For some of us, we've got struggles at work. For some of us, we know all too well what it means. Yeah, we struggle with lust, with greed, with envy, with jealousy, with you know, all that other stuff wants to intrude upon our lives. Where will we find hope? Where will we find renewal? Where will we find new life? In this season of Lent, we, together we have been looking at the themes, encountering God, what have we witnessed? And the specific topic for this morning is, what have we witnessed in our need for renewal? And the particular passage that we're looking at is the one uh, Roger read a portion of that for us this morning, John chapter 11, and we might well be wondering, well now, why would we stop at 26 verses? We all know the story's longer than that. My encouragement is this. Let's not be too quick to jump to the end of the story. If we jump too quick to the end of the story, we risk missing a lesson, lessons that God has for us in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the pain. We're going to look more closely at that passage. Just a couple of things I'd like to say about it before I begin. First of all, we were, I, there's a whole, long, a whole list of characters here. There's Jesus, there's the disciples, there's Lazarus and Mary and Martha, there's the friends and the other bystanders. That's all part of the story. And my suggestion is that rather than spending a lot of time analyzing and trying to decipher each and every individual little part of this story, we allow the story, we, we, the story invites us in. Let us be, see ourselves as participants in that story. And as we enter that story, let us open our lives to what God wants to do in and through us, through his Holy Spirit. Participants in the story, two in particular deserve mention before we go further, Mary and Lazarus. Last week, Julio Chang brought the morning message. Together we looked at that scripture back in Luke 7. That scripture back in Luke 7 describes an unnamed woman who's identified as a sinner. She anoints Jesus, she, she waters washes Jesus' feet with her tears and dries it with her hair. That's the story back in Luke 7. Well, the second verse of this particular passage says that Mary is the person who poured perfume on Jesus' feet and dried them with her hair. Well, so it's very natural to wonder, is that 
Mary described here the same person that we read about back in Luke chapter 7? Probably not. Probably not, because, a variety of reasons, but one, the story of the Mary in John 11 seems to be very stable, well thought of, good family situation. She's got a name. The person back in Luke 7, we're not told what her name is. She's only identified in the community as a sinner. Probably not the same person, okay? The second uh, person to comment on is Lazarus. And back in Luke, and right now the, the chapter escapes me, but back in Luke, we read about a Lazarus who was a beggar at a rich man's table and then who died and went to heaven. Is that Lazarus the same as this Lazarus? Well, probably not. After all, that Lazarus stayed dead. Okay? So probably not the same person. Now, having said that, let's, let's look more closely at the story. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are described as close friends of Jesus. But, but Lazarus is sick. And Jesus and his disciples, they're someplace else. And we get a bit of a sense in the story that they are some distance away. Mary and Martha send word to Jesus, Lazarus is sick, help. Probably more than just a common cold. Something's going on here. Somebody needs to do something. Now, some of us have had sick children, or parents, or siblings. Some of us know all about that calling 911 or making that quick trip to the ER. There's a certain, anxious is way too mild of a word, okay? Somebody's got to do something. But what happens? What, what happens if the ambulance doesn't come? What happens if you get to the ER and they say, oh, well, we're, we're full. You're going to have to go to that hospital that's 30 miles away. And can we catch something of the desperation? that Mary and Martha must have been feeling in that moment? And then we read that Jesus, Jesus got the word, but he waited. He waited two more days. Why? We don't know, other than to say throughout the Gospel of John, in a number of different places, we read about Jesus talking about God's timing. There's a very real sense that Jesus was in tune with God's timing. Some of us know a, a bit about timing. Um, yeah, Jonathan and, and Nick, that, yeah. Juggling was great. It's all about timing, right? Some of us have worked on car engines. Uh, get the timing belt off by a notch or two. Uh, that vehicle might run. It's not going to run very well. And, and yeah, we're, we're into baseball season. At least the Phillies have won three games so far. They're above 500. Uh, timing. Uh, any hitter can tell you that there's a fraction of a second difference between a home run and a foul ball. It's timing. And I know we have a number of musicians here. Uh, what happens when, when the choir uh, gets a half a beat ahead of the accompanist? Or the drummer's a half beat behind? It just feels pretty awkward, doesn't it? Timing is so crucial. And it's also true in the Christian life. We're not a very patient bunch, are we? We want everything and we want it yesterday. Jesus received word of Lazarus' illness and he waited. And he waited. And he waited. And finally, after 
after two days, Jesus tells his disciples, okay, it's time to go back. Lazarus is sleeping. Another theme that we often find in the book of John is this, how often misunderstandings crop up. Anyone have any misunderstandings in your family this week? That's okay. You don't have to raise your hand. But yeah, that, that, that's part of life. And, and the disciples, well, if he's sleeping, that's wonderful. No, no, no. He's not sleeping. He's dead. Oh. But we're going back. Why? They were trying to kill you, and you, you want to go back? And Thomas offers a plaintive but brave response. Well, let's go too that we might die with him. And back they go. Now, when they get back to Bethany, we do not know how quickly the illness struck Lazarus. I suspect it was something pretty quick. We're told that when Jesus got back, he was already in the grave four days. Some of us know what it means to lose a loved one quickly. And it might be we got that phone call telling us that a brother had been killed in a car accident dad was gone because of a heart attack. And, and we know that the pain in that moment and the confusion and, and the grief and, and all those swirling emotions going on. Jesus came back to Bethany. And first it's Martha who greets him. And a little bit later, it will be Mary with the same refrain. Lord, if only you had been here. And how many times in the midst of our pain and in the midst of our grief, we too are struggling with the, the what ifs. If only. And we too wonder, where was God in the midst of all of this? as we think about the pain of losing a loved one. Someone has said that that pain is in direct proportion to the love. The more we love, the deeper the grief. And someone else has written that it's almost like there's this exact correspondence that if it didn't matter, it wouldn't matter. But it does matter. And there's pain, and there's grief, and there's suffering, and there's tears. And yes, some of us identify very quickly with Mary and with Martha. That, that's where we are. It hurts. And some of us might see ourselves as, as the friends. And, and I want to make a distinction here between the friends and the bystanders. Bystanders are the folks that, well, like, like going past a car wreck and you're kind of rubbernecking to see what happened. And, and you don't want to get too close because it, there, there's almost that sense that uh, their misfortune might rub off. And, and I don't want to take a chance on catching whatever they've got. That, that's, that's the bystanders. Friends, friends are the people that, that come and stand by us and stand with us. And, and somehow there's that sense that because they're there, they're helping in some way to carry our pain and to carry our grief. It's not because they know exactly the right thing to say, but it's because they're there. It was about 45 years, almost 45 years ago now, I got the phone call that my the brother right next to me had been killed in a car accident. And, and we gathered. 
45 years later, I cannot remember anything anybody said, but I still remember people who were there. That's part of the power of the gathered community, being there for each other in those times of struggle and in those times of grief. And yes, the community was gathered around Mary and Martha in that time. Jesus came, and Jesus said, uh, where, have you, where have you laid him? Take me there. And, and as Jesus and the group is going to the tomb, John writes two little words. Jesus wept. Now, some of us cannot hear those words without remembering our junior high days. And, and for some of you younger ones, believe it or not, I once was in junior high. <laughs> I, I know that's a long, long time ago. But, but in junior high, every so often, you know, we would have this thing of, what's your favorite Bible verse? And invariably somebody would say, Jesus wept, and everybody would laugh. And we knew that was funny because that was the shortest verse in the Bible and that was an easy one to say. The older I get, the more I appreciate that verse. And recently we had an ex, uh, we, we've been participating in this activity called uh, the 12 Scripture Project, selecting our 12 favorite scriptures. I, I don't know if Jesus wept would make my list of favorite 12, but it would be up there pretty close. You see, that verse encapsulates the humanity of Jesus. Yes, Jesus is God. Jesus is God, but Jesus is God who became fully, totally, completely human. He became one of us. And Jesus knows what it means to suffer hunger, to be tired, to be angry, to be moved deeply within his spirit, to know grief and pain like we do. Jesus came to walk with us. Jesus came to be with us. Jesus wept. And I wonder if we too lightly skip over tears of God. That, that our God is not some in vague, impersonal force in the universe. Our God is one who cries over his children and who is with us in the midst of our tears and our pain and our Jesus wept. They go to the tomb. And Jesus tells the bystanders to roll back the stone. What is the response? Lord, it's been four days. He stinks. Friends, death stinks. And I'm not just talking physically. Death stinks. Death disrupts our lives. Death reminds us that we're not going to go on forever. That there is this break, this rupture. Those people that we are so close to and have relied upon, some of them are gone already. And some of them before long, we'll be gone. Death stinks. But, but, and this is the good news. Let's not put a period where God puts a comma. For us, we have that sense that, boom, that's it. 
And God says, uh-uh. There's more. And there's more. And there's more. And we have the invitation of Jesus to Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. Now, just pause here for a moment. Don't have a clue. What if anything Lazarus knew in all of this? Does death really mean that it's this time of sleep and, and we don't know anything until the time of the resurrection? Does death mean that we are in the presence of Jesus and with our, with our God and with our loved ones? Scripture actually kind of holds up both possibilities. We don't know for sure. I do want to say this. If I was Lazarus, and Jesus was saying, you know, I want you to come back to earth and live longer. I'm like, do I have to? <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I've enjoyed this life, it's good. But when I'm gone, please let me go. Okay? But Jesus invited Lazarus to move from the decay of death. Jesus continues to call each one of us, all of his children, to move from death to life. He invites us to be transformed. And that's not just doing a little bit of polishing and cleaning up. Transformation, a total makeover. That's what God is inviting each one of us to do, to be. And yes, do we believe? In the midst of the pain, in the midst of the struggle, do we believe there's more? Do we? Can we? Hold on to Jesus' hand to walk into that newness of life? There's one little footnote here. Jesus calls Lazarus come forth. Lazarus walks out of the tomb. Most folks are joyful. Some are not. Some are scared. If Jesus can do this, what else can he do? Some were threatened and began to take concrete steps to put Jesus to death. But as Lazarus came out of the tomb, he's wrapped with the grave clothes. The grave clothes stink. And Jesus says to those gathered round, unbind him and let him go. You and I, friends, do not bring anyone back from the dead. We don't save anyone. That's what Jesus does. But Jesus does invite us to help set each other free. Do you hear that? It's not about piling rules and regulations on top of people and telling them this is what you should be doing. It's about moving into the freedom and the newness of Christ. And, and help, we're help, called to help each other shed the grave clothes We serve an amazing, wonderful God. Will we walk into the new life that he wants to give us? I pray that we will.